Bon, j'espère que les gens m'entendent. Est-ce que quelqu'un peut me dire... Alors, j'espère aussi que le chat marche. Oh, parfait, on m'entend. Bon. Euh, bonjour tout le monde. Euh, C'est très, très bizarre de ne pas voir les gens, mais euh, euh, je ne sais même pas combien il y a de gens qui me regardent. Donc, euh, voilà, en direct de San Francisco, euh, comme tout le monde, euh, confiné, mais, euh, mais content de, de présenter. Euh, alors, j'ai mon, mon téléphone, donc je peux vous voir euh, sur les chats. Donc, si vous voulez euh, euh, poster des messages, allez-y, mais je vais probablement regarder plutôt après euh, pour euh, s'il y a des questions ou quoi que ce soit. Euh, pour ceux d'entre vous qui ne me connaissent pas, euh, je, je m'appelle Fabien De Vos. Et euh, je crois que, par contre, je n'ai pas réfléchi au fait que je suis en train de parler en français. Alors, est-ce qu'il y euh, a... Il faudrait peut-être mieux que je passe en anglais. All right. Okay, I'm going to switch to English. That's what I thought. Um, so no problem. I can also do that in English, of course. Um, I'm, uh, like I was saying in French, live from San Francisco, like everyone. And uh, I'm very happy to be there uh, virtually with you. Um, so um, for those of you who don't know me, Uh, my name is uh, Fabian Davos, and I'm uh, the director of uh, mobile and web engineering at a company called Wildfront. Um, and this talk is not about... Um... Oh, can you guys hear me? I switched to English. All right, cool. Um, so uh, I've done management for quite a while now. I'm not coding anymore, so this talk is about what is my manager doing all day? And uh, the original title for this talk was actually what the heck is my manager doing all day? Uh, and that's because I'm guessing that a lot of you uh, are kind of wondering, right? Um, is this guy just a lazy ass all day and uh, just uh, doing nothing? Because obviously a manager is not coding. And the reason why a manager is not coding is because a manager should not be coding. First of all, because um, Well, uh, he's probably not very good at it, or uh, at least uh, not anymore. But also because if your manager starts uh, coding, then he's going to start to block everyone. So you definitely don't want your manager to code. Um, the problem is uh, it doesn't feel productive, right? Uh, if I'm not producing code or I'm not uh, talking about, uh, if I'm not building something, then uh, I'm not really uh, productive. So you probably know that your manager is going to meetings all day. And that's about it, right? Going to meetings, and uh, that cannot possibly be something that's important. Um, so to answer that question, uh, I think I came up with a very simple answer, uh, which boils down to communication. Communication uh, is extremely important as a company grow. Uh, as everybody can imagine. Um, but even in a much smaller company, uh, it's still something that's critical. Now, uh, the way that I think about a manager, therefore, is more about routing information uh, sort of everywhere it needs to go. So taking information from places and going uh, and carrying it in the right place. Um, so it's kind of a node of communication, if you think about it. Uh, people are thinking about manager like a boss, but it's absolutely not the case. It's more of a, a router of information packet, uh, if you wish. So in particular, if you are a uh, manager, uh, you probably have a bunch of people reporting to you. So in terms of communication, uh, you know that you're going to have to communicate with those people. And if you sort of build a hierarchy from there, well, as a manager, you also have a manager. So you obviously have your manager that you need to talk to. And then this manager, as a manager, uh, maybe in a small company, it's the CEO. Then, uh, of course, this manager has peers, other executives from other departments. And then your manager has other reports that are probably managing other teams. And then, of course, there is other departments as well uh, that also have employees that probably you need to collaborate with. But uh, that's the hierarchy, and that's the reporting structure. That has nothing to do with the channels of communication that actually needs to happen. 
In fact, as a manager, you have to do 360 communication. You obviously, like I said, have to communicate with your reports. You have to tell them information about what's going on. Uh, and they have to give you status updates and they have to tell you uh, what is going on in their uh, work. But you obviously have to collaborate with people that are in the same department as you. Um, so the colors represent different department. And uh, those people are probably going to be pretty aligned with what you want to do. So it's probably easy. But you also have to collaborate with people that are in another department and they might be optimizing for something slightly different. Uh, and so you might have to convince them. But remember, they don't even report to the same boss as you, right? So you're going to have to build relationship in order to make that work. Then, of course, you have to communicate with your own boss. It's actually pretty complicated uh, because there is the power dynamic, the same one that you have with your reports. But this time, it's reversed. And uh, sometimes you have to convince your boss of something. Sometimes you have to shield your reports of uh, something that your boss is saying. Um, and sometimes uh, you simply have to convince your boss that a direction is better than another. You also have to obviously communicate with your boss's peers. So not only your peers, your reports, but also your boss and your boss's peers. Uh, if your boss is an executive, that means you have to directly communicate with other executives. Uh, and again, it's a bit complicated. They're higher than you on the totem pole, but um, they're not your boss. So you don't directly answer to them. And this is uh, for the pretty picture uh, on the diagram, but uh, obviously it gets way more complicated than that. Sometimes you need to talk directly to your boss's boss. Uh, you need to skip a level and go directly to the CEO, for example. Uh, sometimes you need to communicate with someone else's report, right, in another department. And when that happens, it's get, it gets tricky because uh, you sometimes have to do that uh, to avoid jumping through hoops, but you're actually not following the chain uh, of command. So it can frustrate people. Those type of communication are even harder. The reason why communication is also so complicated is uh, because it creates context switching. And in fact, this is going back to the coding thing. This is why a manager cannot code or cannot produce anything because a manager is literally a resource dedicated to context switch all the time. Uh, the best explanation for that is the blog post, Make Your Schedule Manager Schedule by Paul Graham that some of you might know. Uh, he starts with this great quote, the mere consciousness of an engagement will sometimes worry your whole day. And uh, he explains that programmers dislike meetings so much because they're in a different type of schedule than a uh, manager in particular. And the reason why um, that's the case is because in order to program, for example, to develop software, you have to be very focused for a long stretch of time. But again, the manager is dedicated to concept switch all the time. So the two are fundamentally uh, incompatible. And that leads to something very peculiar, which is the time management of the manager is completely different uh, than the time management than uh, a software engineer will have, for example. And uh, here's finally the answer to the question, what is my manager doing all day? Well, uh, I didn't cheat. And uh, what I decided to do is to just give you my schedule. Um, this is literally my schedule for this week. Uh, no cheating, no blurring. I checked that there was no confidential information in there. Um, you can see my talk on the top left. Uh, it's around 9 a.m. 9, 9 here in San Francisco, so I'm starting my day. And you can see that it's absolutely crazy. By the way, when people look at my schedule, they usually believe that I uh, they, must, they must have made a mistake because they must have uh, checked multiple people uh, this is only my schedule if there is colors because I had to color code my calendar in order to uh, make sure that I could pass it. And you can see that I'm regularly uh, triple or quadruple booked. And the reason why they're triple or quadruple booked is because you end up with more meetings than you have time to fit in the day. Um, and so because of that, you have to actually choose. So many times a day, I have to make a decision on which meetings should I attend because I have multiple, and I obviously cannot be in multiple places at once. Even virtually, it's impossible to follow multiple meetings. Yes, we tried. Um, 
But what happens in, in those meetings, right? Well, uh, I try to simplify into three big buckets. And the last one is the uh, one that you probably believe manager uh, are using the most, but in fact, they are using it the least, and that's making decisions. It's a fraction of the time. Most of the time is spent getting context, gathering information from other people. Then a part of the time, I, I would have, uh, I, I should have put the bar even smaller. A fraction of that time is spent giving context, giving information to the people. So you gather a lot more information than you have to redistribute because you have to redistribute the right information to the right people. Sometimes it's simply, oh, I know what you're talking about. You should talk to that other person. And here's the name of that person. And then again, a fraction of that is spent making decisions. Um, because a manager should not be barking orders. Uh, that's a very, very bad idea. Uh, in particular in our field where uh, software engineers are very precious, there is absolutely no way that the manager barking orders um, will get a team successful or even keep um, their employees. In fact, uh, most of the time the making decisions uh, that you do is more about simply giving permissions. There is a bunch of people that are going to just wait for you to prove something or ask you to do something and they are looking for permission, not uh, often because they believe that they need that permission, but just because if you are giving them permission, you're okaying something, then you are taking on the responsibility and they're not, and that's part of the job. You take the responsibility, if something goes wrong, you give credit if everything goes right. Um, and the few real decisions that you're making are more about trade-offs. So if any decision is simple to make, they never scale it to you. In fact, you want to decentralize as much as possible. So you want to give people the power to make their own decisions. But when the decision is scaled to you, it's usually because it's a tough trade-off. It's a tough balance between option A and option B. And there is no right or wrong answer that is obviously apparent because otherwise, again, the decision would have been made without you being in the loop. So you have to make only the hard decision and the hard trade-offs in the end. And again, live with the consequences. The time that you spend, uh, the, the, most of your time is spent actually influencing and convincing people. Uh, and so in lots of those meetings and conversations, what you're doing is you're trying to influence others through different means. Um, maybe you're trying to convince them that uh, what they're doing uh, will lead to more problems. Maybe you're trying to convince them that your idea is the right one. Maybe you're trying to convince them that your team should not take on that project. Or maybe you're trying to convince an executive that you need uh, more staffing. Uh, most of the time, you cannot just uh, force something. You have to uh, do your entire job through influencing and convincing. Now, there is different types of communication that achieve those goals. The 101, uh, by the way, uh, I know that in Europe it's not always standard, that it's really important. It's just a face-to-face -face conversation. Uh, it could be with your own reports, but it could be with someone else in the organization. That happens all the time. Oh, sorry, by the way, th this is the updated uh, slides for nowadays. This looks like that right now. Um, then, of course, small groups. Um, small groups are something like a meeting, but also could be, you know, gathering a few people to quickly think about something. And then there is uh, communication like I'm doing right now, right, in front of a larger audience and uh, usually one person presenting. So each type of uh, communication based on how many people are in the communication have different purposes. So during one-on-one, you're usually uh, capable of doing things like coaching someone giving feedback, which sometimes is tough feedback, uh, giving career advice. If there's a few people, you can usually make decisions, you can brainstorm ideas, you can sync and get on the same page. Uh, after about 10, that's it. You cannot make decisions efficiently anymore. It's all about giving updates and receiving updates. Uh, and you can sometimes use that to try to inspire your people, which is uh, really important, try to motivate them. You can still do that in the group settings. And of course, do not forget written communication um, for two reasons. The first one is that a lot of people really prefer written communication. So all of the different activities 
they will prefer to have that in written format. In fact, uh, the company I work for, we have a tool for this where it checks in automatically and people can give you written um, uh, suggestions or uh, feedback. The other reason is because of what I'm about to talk uh, uh, next, which is uh, very often you actually are creating things. You're making stuff up. Uh, as a manager, you're constantly making stuff up. Uh, you have to, because uh, literally nothing uh, that uh, is fal facilitating the work is in place or is not is not create, created uh, ex nihilo. Obviously, you have to have someone come up with it. So in particular processes, right? Um, that's something that comes to mind pretty easily. So I had to implement a whole uh, process of agile methodology throughout the company, for example. Uh, I was the one leading that effort, so I made up a bunch of processes. Uh, projects. Um, recently, I decided that we needed a uh, unified um, sort of UI toolkit, which is a uh, way for us to have a design language that is uh, unified across platform and, and throughout our apps. Uh, we didn't have that, uh, just made that up. Policies, right? I've reviewed countless policies. Uh, sometimes you just have to create uh, a certain policy um, to take time off or uh, any kind of uh, boring and mistreating things like that. Teams, sometimes you have to create teams. Uh, we didn't have uh, an Android infrastructure team, an iOS infrastructure team, and so I created them. I just made them up. And even roles. The best example is not uh, from something I did, but uh, we created the concept of a CTO of a system in our company. So uh, this person eventually became our CTO, uh, was first granted this, this new completely made up title of a subsystem, and that was terrific thing because he got to be a little bit of a CTO be before he was ready to take on uh, the CTO role for the whole company. And of course, as you grow and nowadays I'm managing managers, uh, you even have to make up the org. So right now we're redesigning the org and this is obviously uh, a, lot of, a lot of work. So all of that requires you to write a lot of documents. So written communication obviously matters a lot. And in the middle of the, all of that, you have to think about uh, long-term. So you need to find somehow, sometime to think long-term and think strategic, uh, which means you have to think about where do you want to bring the team next? And that might be in the next year, in the next few years. And usually the higher up you go, uh, the longer term you have to think. Now, a lot of those conversations are absolutely not fun. Conflict resolution, obviously. Um, when two people are really fighting and you have to somehow uh, make sure that they can work together again. Performance issues. If someone is not performing well, it's never a fun conversation to have. And then, of course, personal issues, right? Uh, everybody has personal problems and it comes into your life. And this time you have to be what I call the chief psychologist, right? Uh, it's a lot of the job, it's a big part of the job. And it can be draining on a manager, uh, which is why uh, all this context switching and on top of that, those really difficult conversations, right? Uh, it means that even if in terms of number of hours, it might not always seem like a lot, it could be very, very draining mentally. Sometimes a simple conversation ends up being um, taking you down for the rest of the day. But of course, there's also the fun part, like seeing employee growth, prom promoting them, for example. Um, things running smoothly because you made decisions that worked out, and decisions that you made months ago paying off way down the road. Uh, that's extremely rewarding, of course. Um, and that's about all I got. Um, so thank you very much for listening. I have absolutely no feedback, so I hope that it was interesting. It was just an overview. Um, but if you have questions, uh, please let me know.
Oh, okay. So I'm supposed to switch if that's the, if I'm remembering correctly. Uh, how do I do this? How do you communicate with the weird antisocial, I don't say what I think, liar manager? <laughs> okay, uh, that one is uh, really interesting. Uh, well, um, it's a problem for sure, uh, and that's what I call uh, managing up, right? The only thing that you can do there is uh, you have to think about yourself as the manager and your boss as the person being managed which means that you have to um, literally bring that person to, to do or understand your point of view, um, just like if you were uh, the manager of that person. So that, that's what's called managing up. And it's extremely, extremely difficult. It's a, it's a skill in, in and of itself. Um, now, if it's that bad though, there is always the option of changing jobs, I guess. Uh, <laughs> People leave managers, by the way, uh, not jobs. How do you end up taking technical decisions on subject people you manage are more expert on? Well, that one is easy. Uh, you don't. Uh, that's, that's the best thing you can do, right? Uh, the, the, the best way um, to handle taking the clinical decision if you're not the expert is to let the expert make that decision. So that's, that's that was kind of the of the talk, right? Like you're not making those, a lot of those decisions um, as a manager. Most of the time what you want to do instead is empowering your people to make those decisions. Now, if you really, really have to, sometimes you have to. Um, and uh, the best way that I can uh, think of then is to gather as much context as possible. So to ask a lot of questions, a lot, lot of in-depth questions until you sort of get to the root of the problem. Um, but the best way is not, not to do it. In one on one, give example. Don't you think that one one also here from manager to take from the developer? Uh, yeah. So sorry, I should have specified. Um, the examples that I gave were just like the maybe the most obvious or representative or something, but it, they, are, they are absolutely not uh, a complete list. It's just a few examples. So yeah, absolutely. And one on ones, in fact, ideally, I mean, the best manager I know. I'm, I'm still uh, forcing myself to do that, by the way, because I talk too much, as you know, um, is to listen most of the time. Yeah, you, you should listen, ideally, at least eight, at least 50%, if not 80% of the time in a one-on-one. -on -one. I, I never managed to do that, but uh, yeah, absolutely. But it should not be, a one-on-one -on -one should never be for status updates. So if you have a boss that think, uh, give me a status update in a one-on-one, -on -one, sometimes you, you have to because you, you need some information, but ideally a one-on-one -on -one is for uh, the employee to be able to express what they what they need to tell and whatever that might be. Concerns, uh, questions about their career or other people and so on. Um, what are some techniques you have used to solve, <laughs> solve those tricky people problems? Um, the best technique is Again, like I just said, to listen a lot. Um, the, the best way is to suppress your uh, natural instinct to say what you want to say and instead listen first. Um, another trick is you have to adapt to the person in front of you. So this is a management technique that's uh, actually during one of the training I did at Berkeley. Um, that was a real revelation to me. I thought that manager had to find their style or even just a person had to find their style and like uh, get into their groove like this. But in, in fact, you realize that you have to adapt your communication to the person in front of you because everybody's different. So someone is going to be uh, much more receptive if you make a joke. Sometimes it's, sometimes uh, someone is going to be way more receptive if you are uh, very serious or whatever that might be. So people leave manager, people don't leave jobs. Do you believe the reverse is possible? People join for manager because, yes, it's absolutely 100% possible. Uh, in fact, that happened to me. Um, so I had a bunch of people, uh, and it could, it could be a double-edged sword, by the way, but I had a bunch of people joining my team just because they wanted to work with me specifically. 
uh, it's dangerous because you also want people that are, in their case, they were also passionate about the mission of the company, but you, you really want people that are passionate about the mission of the company. But yes, it totally happens in reverse. Um, and I've seen, oh, I've seen also people follow their, their boss uh, to a different company. Uh, what are some techniques you have used to solve those really problems? I answered that. How do you handle the scheduling of all your one-on-one? -on -one and <laughs> oh, uh, the scheduling is a nightmare. Uh, I sit down uh, pretty much every night and I have to move things around, cancel things. Uh, I haven't done it for today, for example, which means that uh, I'm going to do that right after I'm done <laughs> answering those questions. Um, and... Uh, the only way that you can do this is just constantly play Tetris with your calendar. Uh, the other technique that we have is we have, a, so uh, usually I don't, I don't need to do that, but in rare occasion I need to ask for help. And so we have an executive assistant uh, and she's absolutely fantastic and she works miracles. So if really nothing else works, uh, I ask her. Uh, can I have your slides? Yes, I will publish my slides. There is not much written in them, but uh, I will happily publish my slides. Okay. I think that's about it. So thank you. <laughs> this is awkward. Bye.